Well, welcome everyone. I am Steve Parrish. I'm the co-director of the New York Life Center for Retirement Income at the American College of Financial Services. And I wanna thank you for signing in today. And before we begin, on behalf of the American College, I really wanna tell you that we hope your family is healthy and that you're getting through the situation at least adequately and possibly even well. So we're glad you took the time today to continue your awareness and education. Now I'll, I'll fill you in on the CE process shortly, but first let me set up what we're covering today. Today's topic is both timely and important. We're in the middle of a national health crisis because of the pandemic. And today we're discussing the primary health insurance program for the segment of the population that's most affected by COVID-19, i.e. the elderly. And even before the pandemic, I mean, the Medicare system was top of mind to many. Funding has been an issue, and this, what is otherwise kind of a bland topic of Medicare, has become a source of talking points during the current election cycle. But we're not here today to talk about politics. We're not going to speculate about the future or lecture you on what should be done with Medicare. Rather, our guest today can help us determine how advisors can work with clients on Medicare and, and related issues that are happening right here, right now. So let me use that as an opportunity to uh, introduce my guest. Uh, Dan Mangus uh, has the feet on the street experience and knowledge to help us today. Uh, we've published his bio and it's here on the screen, so I won't go into detail, but, uh, but the bottom line is that as head of, the, of sales for senior marketing specialists, he helped serve over 10,000 agents nationwide. Uh, he made the point to me that uh, when we as advisors run into those out of the ordinary Medicare questions that we might get, what, once or twice a year, his firm instead hears those questions daily. And I'll, I'll bet that with COVID-19 and the CARES Act, there are a lot more of those out of the ordinary questions being asked. So Dan, welcome. I just want to say hi. Good morning. Well, to get you started, I want to give you a quick peek at some important research that's been generated at the American College. Now, we continue to provide one of the most comprehensive retirement literacy studies available, and we've just completed our third study. And many of you are aware of our past studies. We did one in 2014 and one in 2017 on retirement literacy. Well, this 2020 study was taken during the first wave of the pandemic, so it's particularly relevant. Um, we'll present more detail on the summary in future webinars, but I just want to give you a quick summary to kind of set up talking about uh, Medicare specifically. So uh, working as we have in the past with Greenwald and Associates, we sur surveyed over 1,500 qualified retirees and pre-retirees. And so the requirements to be in this besides age um, was that these individuals have to have over $100,000 in household assets, and that's beyond the, the value, the equity in their house. And what we did is we then asked 38 questions about retirement planning so we could kind of gauge their, their retirement literacy. So here on the screen are the results. And um, uh, they're, they're what they are, I'll just put it that way. But um, as, in, as was the case in both 2014 and 2017, retirement literacy is very, very low overall. 81% failed the 38 question retirement literacy in the average uh, quiz and the, the average score was 42%. Um, and for consumers age 60 to 75, the retirement literacy score is even a little worse than it was before. So um, people have a lot to learn here. Now, there were some subgroups that scored better on the quiz, but, but still none of them really had, on average, passing scores. And what concerns me a lot is the most problematic topic for consumers, as far as retirement literacy, is issues dealing with strategies and products to maintain assets, which I would include with that, uh, Medicare would be an example of a product. So specific to Medicare, I just wanted to let you know, or Medicare and medical insurance, uh, three questions we asked that will give you a feel for it, where actually they did better than they did on some of the others, but it's still a concern. 
one question we said is traditional Medicare will cover which of the following medical expenses? Well, just a little over half, 57%, knew that it covered physical exams. So only half of them even knew that Medicare covered that. Or we also had a true and false question. Medicare supplement insurance policies are most commonly purchased to cover the deductibles and co-pays that are charged under Medicare Parts A and B. Well, in some ways it was encouraging. 74% knew this one was true, but that also means that more than a quarter didn't know that was true. And then um, another example is true or false. The total out-of-pocket medical expenses for married couples in retirement is relatively consistent from retiree to retiree. Well, that's, that's false. It's very different from retiree to retiree. Now, 62% knew that that was false, but that means uh, over a third didn't know that that was false. So enough said on this, and again, we'll have a lot more on it, but retirement literacy is very important, and we need our clients to know more to be able to retire successfully. So today, let's focus on one of those key retirement issues, and that is Medicare. Um, Dan, you heard my intro. But to set the stage, can you let the listeners know a little bit about what you do, what your firm does related to Medicare and related issues so they know where you're coming from? Absolutely. I had a uh, personal practice for 30 years myself and uh, meeting with clients. and I uh, had a pretty, what ended up being a pretty large uh, practice before I sold it about 10 years ago. But uh, now I have the privilege of working uh, on a totally different side of our business. One of my field marketing organizations that I was affiliated with was a, a company called Senior Marketing Specialist. So I'd known them for many, many years. But uh, I was very interested in working with them. I came on board to head up the, the sales team. But uh, in the industry, uh, we're what is known as a FMO, or field marketing organization, essentially a national distribution arm of, of carriers. And we help agents and agencies across the country to, uh, to choose the appropriate carriers they want to add to their portfolio, assist with the contracting, their certification, getting everything set up. We actually help them build business plans for implementation of that in case they want to set up a division inside of their company or, or expand what they're doing with Medicare. And then we support those ongoing activities with helplines and training and, and compliance coaching. So bottom line, you know what you're talking about and you do it daily, got it. <laughs> so given that background, that extensive background, can, can you first paint us a picture of how M Medicare was progressing pre-pandemic? I mean, and I'm personally now on Medicare and I'm aware of all these moving parts. So I'm just curious what the status of Medicare is in general. And again, before pandemic even started, how was, Part D doing since that's the newer one for prescriptions. Uh, how are doctors dealing with these reimbursements? Are there any trends with, you know, Medicare Advantage versus Medigap? Just to kind of set it up. Absolutely. Uh, well, we went into 2020 already, uh, even before anything happened in the first quarter, with a lot of changes happening to Medicare. In fact, you'll, there's a, a slide that kind of shows some of the things that started happening as we came into the year. Uh, we had already seen a lot of people migrating uh, into Medicare Advantage over the course of the year. That's been kind of a steady in increase every year. There's a lot of reasons for that from a uh, compensation standpoint to uh, providers. But one of the big changes was uh, around the, the Medicare Access and CHIP Authorization, Reauthorization Act of 2015, or MACRA. Uh, a couple of the big things that were effective on January 1st was one of them was that uh, Medicare supplements themselves were changing as far as what would be available to an individual when they came on Medicare. Uh, CMS wanted to do away with first dollar coverage and two of the plans uh, offered first dollar coverage. So they changed it, but only changed it for people who were newly eligible as of January 1st of 2020. So one of the most popular plans for Medicare supplements out there is a plan F uh, and C and F both plans offered part B deductible coverage. Mm -hmm. So they no longer have that program available to individuals who were eligible prior to one, one of 2020, but it's important to remember 
that plan is still fully available uh, for purchase or uh, may, keeping it or whatever for anybody that uh, already had it. So that's about 60 million people who could still purchase and, and keep uh, Medicare Plan F. However, you're seeing a lot of migration into Plan G from that, and, and you're going to continue to see the other plans uh, grow in their popularity and things. But that was effective January 1, so there was a lot of confusion around that. And then from a provider standpoint, Medicare had changed all of their ID numbers. So they changed it to a Medicare beneficiary identifier, which was a non-logical series of letters and numbers away from the utilization of the HICN, which was um, the social security with a letter, which I kind of identified. And, and so even though that happened prior to 1-1 of 2020, that was the deadline for providers to start using that. And so that was a, that was a, that was a big change. But there were several other things. Um, CVS and Aetna were merging, Centene and WellCare were merging. Uh, those had tremendous impact on, on many millions of individuals, but also agents. Uh, it meant a lot of different things like recontracting, recertifications, things like that. Um, Medicare.gov, which was the main site and still is that advisors used to compare MA and PD plans. I went through its first major change in over 10 years. Uh, Medicare.gov and MyMedicare.gov consolidated into a single website uh, to make some improvements and things. But anytime there's change, there's always uh, a lot of angst around that. It, it created a, a more complicated system for advisors to be able to access uh, comparisons and things where accounts had to be set up, et cetera. So it was, it was a nice move in some ways created some complications in another. Uh, another thing that happened going into 2020 was um, the average payment for Medicare Advantage plans increased by 2.53%. Um, uh, so that was higher uh, than initially it proposed. And so there was more money that entered into that picture. And uh, by the way, it's gonna be 1.66% in 2021 for if anybody's curious about that part of it. But that, those, some of those extra dollars, there was also some changes within uh, some of the regulations that allowed Medicare Advantage to change. Uh, they did some really interesting things starting the first of the year with uh, grocery shopping and home environment services like car air cleaners and carpet shampooing and stuff like that, which was totally different. But they did change some things that although they didn't seem as important on January of 2020, have become important and, and a couple of them were special meals that they can deliver so based on individuals conditions like maybe they're diabetic and they need a special diabetic diet some some of the plans actually deliver meals that are, are set for that there's also a very popular program called papa which is a college student pal program i call it a family on demand but essentially it's a it's it's in order to keep you know the uh individual healthy emotionally as well as physically, which obviously translates to that. And then they gave them a lot more flexibility for um, supplemental benefits. And so that gave kind of an edge, if you will, over some of the Medicare fee for service. Right now there's an attitude of, of uh, support for those programs moving uh, more and migrating more towards that, that direction. And so you're seeing a lot of things happening. And then uh, a couple more things, just real quickly on that too. CMS implemented uh, several sections of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. Uh, one section uh, allowed additional telehealth benefits, ironically, as part of government-funded basic benefits. Again, uh, when that was all put in place, telemedicine was a very small percentage of Medicare Advantage plans had that as an option. Uh, now. 100% in 2021 will have it. Many of them already do, of course, and have changed that throughout this year as well. And then they also did some integration with Medicare and Medicaid. I know a lot of the advisors on the line work with Medicaid. Uh, because of that integration between Medicare and Medica Medicaid, uh, it gave one appeals process across both programs. So there was a, there was a lot of jumps. You, you mentioned the donut hole. Uh, donut hole had changed. Uh, going into the year, uh, there was uh, basically it got shallower and wider. 
there was a big jump uh, in the end catastrophic coverage phase. It went from $5,100 to $6,350, which was a pretty dramatic jump for when people would actually get out of that donut hole. And they quote unquote closed the donut hole. Uh, they had already for, for uh, name brand drugs gone into and went to a 75-25 uh, cost share uh, that was added to generics. And that is considered by the way, closed uh, whenever they hit 75-25% cost share. So that donut hole is now technically closed. Uh, but uh, there's several things that also you would ask about some of the doctors dealing with uh, some of the max reimbursement. Uh, that's, we see most doctors taking assignment and really the, the real reason for that is how they're paid. Um, if they take assignment, they get 100% of the recommended fee schedule. If they don't, if they're considered non-participating, they only get 95% and then they have to try to bill the balance. Uh, and since they're trying to build the balance and, and they can have up to a 15% excess, that can, you have to really weigh that out, whether or not it's uh, the added cost for more money to be lost in bad debts and collections and things like that. But they also get other things that they can participate in, they can get compensated for. And then there's a very small percentage, less than 1% that are actually opt out of Medicare. If they opt out, then Medicare will not reimburse either the doctor or the patient for that, but that's a very small number. So yeah, we had a lot going on. Uh, this slide uh, I think is relevant because one, uh, this is a piece that you can get on medicare.gov uh, as far as a tool, there's several publications you can get off of Medicare. I love them because there are two things, they're, they're free and they're compliant. Um, but uh, that's a, that premium was pretty stable. Medicare Part B premium went from 135 uh, 50 to 144.60. But uh, I know a lot of you deal with IRMA and the increased percentages of, of payment for Medicare Part B. Uh, the base pay for, for just for reference is based on the actual cost of Medicare, the true cost of Medicare. 25% uh, is what the average Part B premium is. And each one of these levels, they go 35%, 50%, 65, 80, and 85% is what they utilize. And they use a two-year-old tax return to do those numbers. So many of you might want to find out how to appeal. I can certainly show you how to do that if you ever need to appeal IRMA. But yeah, going into 2020, a lot of changes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good summary of uh, one of one of the questions I had here is, could they make it any more complex? And um, <laughs> one quick comment that there are just so many planning opportunities here. In my own case, I was right at the edge of having my Medicare um, Part B go up, the chart right in the middle of the picture of the screen here. Uh, but by doing an IRA, I was able to get it a few dollars below and save myself a 40% increase in the um, Part B premium. So there's a reason we need planners. Um, I want to mention one thing before we go on to the next question. Several of you are asking about the slides. The, we'll have the recording posted, the slides available, and uh, Dan has graciously offered to also give us his um, email um, as a follow-up, which I very much appreciate. So uh, yes, we're going to have follow-up with all of this. And um, the one thing on the survey I mentioned, the literacy um, research, we're going to have a lot coming from the American College on that. I was just giving you kind of a taste of it. So yes to all those questions. So moving on, uh, let's fast forward to the era of COVID-19 and the CARES Act. Uh, from my perspective, uh, federal legislation's gotten really tricky in this, and it's tougher to deal with some of the laws than usual. I mean, it's already complicated, but... Um, First of all, let's start. We've got, you know, the ACA is in flux. So um, we know through ACA, Medicaid has been expanded in some states, not in some others. Um, some states have vibrant active exchanges and some don't. And as you are well aware, uh, the United States Supreme Court has said they're going to take up looking at the constitutional challenge, the ACA, the week after the November election. So a lot's moving on with that. And then we have the various laws and rules that actually were promulgated as part of COVID-19. 
So um, we have, you know, things from the federal legislation like the CARES Act to state and local regulations. And it's not easy to sort through these laws because of the wording. For example, one that came up that as I was looking at this, um, in a few minutes, I'll mention the temporary COBRA extension rule. But I just think it's interesting. What the law actually does is extend COBRA deadlines to beyond the, quote, outbreak break period, which it defines as, so what's the outbreak period? 60 days after the end of the declared COVID-19 national emergency or another date provided by um, agencies in the future. Well, as a, I'm an attorney and I can read this stuff, but what's that mean? I mean, consumers and employers can't just work with a fixed date. They have to know when the national emergency is considered legally over. So my point in bringing this up is it's, the poor consumer has a lot to absorb. With all that, Dan, and let's address the key subject. What's the status of Medicare right now? We have um, an existing law, but the CARES Act has something to say about the subject. I guess because of limited time, what are the issues that advisors need to be aware of? Well, you, you brought up some really, really good points. And I think one of the things I'm working with the carriers a lot myself, I know that, you know, some of the casualty reserving that they have is, is really throwing a, a dart at the board for some of those issues. And, and anything that impacts the carriers from that side impacts Medicare on this side. So it's very, very important that, you know, we, they use a lot of reference-based pricing on group plans. So things that happen inside Medicare obviously have far reaching. Um, but I think uh, in looking at what's actually going on with, with COVID and with individuals, the methods uh, and delivery of care have changed. Uh, we're seeing huge, huge spikes, obviously, in telemedicine. Uh, there's like the VA alone have a thousand percent increase uh, in the utilization of those programs. And the way that people are more comfortable right now in communicating and buying has changed. Uh, that seems rather obvious. Uh, however, it, it means as an advisor, your business plan has to uh, adjust and move with that. But because of some of this, clients are, are more aware of unplanned illnesses and things happening to them. And they've seen what happens when access to care gets limited all of which really, really points back to the advisor. But some of the specific things, uh, individuals have postponed non-emergency health care. Um, wellness checks are way, way down. It's, it's frightening how down. Um, and because of that, the complications of that are being looked at by all fronts right now, states and federal, from the medic medication costs, the cost of more complex health care issues, long-term care issues down the road, uh, either directly or indirectly. And so it's really important to take a holistic uh, look. And like you, I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting what, uh, what SCOTUS has to say on the ACA, probably be spring of 2021 before we see it, but still I'm very anxious. But um, right now that the, I guess the biggest things I've been dealing with is between the first of the year and right now, there's, there's been over 200 Medicare legislative and regulatory changes in response uh, to what is happening with inside of, of Medicare. And so uh, like for instance, um, the, the characteristics of those regulatory changes, uh, just a, a list that I have here, 12 of them were alternative care sites related, 27 benefits and care management, 55 conditions of participation, seven, expanded testing, 40 payment systems and quality programs, uh, 35 provider capacity and workforce, four reporting and audit requirements, 14 safety requirements and 18 telehealth. And, and those are, then you have the sub regulatory changes that have happened almost on a weekly basis. Just CMS is just constantly, uh, I really do recommend that you watch closely uh, CMS's news room to watch what is happening, uh, just so that you can have an early heads up for some of those things uh, as they transpire. Uh, so, you know, there's a big flux of all of that happening. It opens up a lot of, of opportunities for individuals. And if you take a look at this slide, this next one on the COVID cases, 
This gives you an idea of, of the impact and who it's impacting uh, as you're dealing with Medicare. The, one of the interesting things, and I'll bring this out later about end-stage renal disease, but you can see the exposure that those individuals have and the danger of that. So you couple that with uh, people not getting their checkups properly and not being able to afford some medications that they need. Uh, all of those kind of things come together as a perfect storm of creating some very, very big concerns for the population that are over 65. And, and keeping in mind that 80% of all the COVID deaths have happened uh, to people that are 65 and plus. It's a pretty scary thing but you can see some of the different impacts on individuals and even on the on the dual Medicare and Medicaid just simply because of uh, some of the uh, access to care and different types of programs that are in place and obviously they're trying to correct uh, some of those situations right now but the, the carriers have had to adjust uh, CMS is adjusting providers are trying to adjust they did a an advance payment uh, to providers, but anytime you have advance payment, then you have a time whenever you're not getting that, you know, because you're making up for that. Those kind of ebbs and flows have really, really impacted. Small hospitals have happened a lot. I, I would be very surprised if we don't see a lot of murders and acquisitions happen uh, after the first of the year, simply because of the financial status of a lot of these different provider groups and, and providers. And, and maybe you've in some ways a answered this, but that, that's what advisors are, need to be aware of. Are there issues consumers specifically need to be aware of as a result of COVID-19? Uh, how's it affecting you know, healthcare for that age group? I'm sorry, you, you broke up, Steve. I, I apologize. How's it affect from what age group? Uh, no, I was really asking, is there anything uh, that that consumers need to be aware of as a result of COVID-19 beyond what we just talked about here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the things to keep aware of is uh, the way, as you can see here, what, some of the things that Medicare actually does cover, um, but they also need to be aware of what the carriers are doing. A lot of the carriers have expanded a lot of their benefits. They've dropped off co-pays. Uh, they've changed this, some of the design. They've given people new access to, to uh, care in different ways than they were used to before. Uh, the other thing is uh, I would really advise individuals with so much happening in this or any other crisis, there seems to be a lot of predators out there. Uh, there's a lot of um, unverified, inaccurate information that flows. Uh, Really, really, if there has ever been a time for a client to have a good insurance advisor, it is absolutely right now. Uh, I mentioned this earlier about the screenings, but the cancer screenings are down by half. Please, if you're a person that's over 65, please get your preventive. You shared some of those uh, uh, retirement literacy stats a minute ago, and those are frightening to me to think that people don't even know that they can get some of those things. Uh, of course, flu season is coming up and they're going to, we're in it right now, we're just starting in it. Uh, so individuals are going to have a lot of questions. So they need to take actions. Um, another thing too, because of COVID, they need to really watch the uh, ANOC letters or annual notice of change letters that they're going to get in September to make sure that their plan is not either exiting or making changes uh, that could be impactful to them. But there's a couple sites that I have there on the screen to enable people to, to uh, kind of keep track of what the government is doing on coronavirus. Keep them educated. Uh, as an advisor, I would really advise stepping up your newsletters and making sure that individuals know some of the specific steps. A lot of the questions that come into my office are things that you would think that everybody knew and they don't. Uh, so, you know, don't make it, you know, don't feel like you're putting out information that may be redundant. Give them some, some good information at this time. Point and Turn to your advisor. That's my main advice. <laughs> well, since you have that background, let me, uh, let's sneak a peek at the future. When they eventually come up with a vaccine, which one hopes they will, 
uh, what trends are likely to occur? I mean, are, are we sitting on pent up demand? Is it gonna cause new pressures on Medicare itself? Uh, it, it definitely will. It's gonna cause pressures on the entire healthcare system across the board. Uh, there's a pent up uh, activity that is going to ultimately happen uh, whenever they do kind of release that valve, the, uh, the fact that uh, so many, even ER visits are down dramatically, so many things that have, have stifled some much needed care, people have not taken care of that properly. And so, yes, there's definitely going to be that, that bubble that will burst after the end of that uh, situation. Um, but right now, there's no vaccine. I think one of the things that I would suggest is that remembering that if they do come up one, with one, it will be covered by Medicare. Uh, so that whenever they do have that, so they can have that rest, you know, they can rest assured of that. Um, so uh, then if they have Medicare Advantage plan, they have, uh, you know, access to the, the same benefits. Uh, Medicare Advantage is used in a lot of different environments. And so it's not just the atypical person that's on Medicare. It, uh, it's, uh, Medicare is a wraparound, uh, the, uh, Medicaid is a wraparound program for Medicare, so is TRICARE for Life, which is, affects both the Medicare population and the retired veteran population, and that can be original Medicare or Medicare Advantage, and so the impacts of Medicare Advantage impact all of those. Uh, they can kind of rest at ease that those things are going to be able to react to some of those and and uh, adjust. So I think that I think the big thing is not to be um, just overly concerned that they're not going to have coverage, but be very conscious that they're fully utilizing the benefits that they have. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, as I monitor questions, we have different um, questions like uh, what's donut hole mean or ANOC, but one that has mm -hmm. come up a couple times and I didn't know the answer to either is when we were talking about COVID-19, what is ESRD? Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I apologize for using um, it, the name of my book is Talking Medicare. It's because it's a totally different language. I apologize. But, okay. but ESRD is end stage renal disease. Uh, so uh, the individuals that have end-stage renal disease, um, there's several things to be conscious of, especially if you work in the group market. One is after they have their transplant, uh, after a period of time, they will lose their Medicare again. So a lot of times people will drop their group coverage that have end-stage renal disease, uh, go on Medicare, get Medicare coverage, everything is all fine. They go through the, the transplant and then they lose Medicare, but they're still... 62 years old or something and have a gap between it and, and Medicare eligibility. Right. But in stage renal disease, I do want to point out one very important thing about that. Uh, it's a dramatic change for 2021. Uh, in stage renal disease is an elimination question right now for someone enrolling into a Medicare Advantage plan. That is being removed in 2021. So that question will not eliminate someone from enrolling into a Medicare Advantage that has big impact. It has big impact on loss ratios for Medicare supplement carriers. It has big impact for losses for Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, of course, they have the ability to get reimbursed for that, but it also has big impact on all the different medications and things like that that are related to that. Okay. Good, thanks. And, um, you know, when you and I were preparing for this, you mentioned that disasters and emergencies, and we certainly have our fair share of those these days, um, they cause a wave of new insurers entering the market. And I got thinking about that's true, but tell us a little bit about this and what's it mean for the advisors that are listening? Well, you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting, um, I had a conversation, there's a good friend of mine, his name's Sidney Boston. Uh, he's a professor and a, and a uh, advisor, but he's also one of my mentors. But here's his comment. I'll just share it with you. He says, because uh, we were texting, but I mean, emailing back and forth. He said, for PNC companies, the big hits, if any, are already baked in the cake. Premium increases will meet less resistance under the current conditions. Once raised, premium levels will stay high for some time while insurers build their reserves. Also, with low interest rates, high equity valuations, and central banks in many countries buying equities, the fund is buying junk bonds, capital is cheap and returns are low. 
insurers who want to beef up their capital structures can attract a lot of capital by paying only a very small premium over current capital market returns. By historical standards, the cost of the new capital is very low, even if insurers pay a premium over current market yields. Also, there is less uh, driving, so like for car insurance, et cetera, and lower property damage in non-ride areas. The more diverse carriers have not seen their margins decrease to levels which hurt future, future earnings. Uh, also, by the way, there's really not evidence that COVID is, is hurting insurers, health insurance margins uh, right now, which is why I was talking a minute ago about some of the casualty reserves are trying to figure out how much it is gonna impact them long-term. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Just basically when you kind of boil the fat off of it, it, it may lead to new companies or new lines in, the, in existing carriers are selling up or repurposing of existing companies uh, this happened, by the way, after major hurricanes. It's happened already. It happened after 9-11. Uh, so it doesn't seem too logical, but I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of new entrants into, into the markets from PNC carriers. Even right now, there's a lot of activity that I'm seeing kind of behind the scenes with purchasing some of the Medicare supplement carriers, et cetera. Right. Well, let's move on to another uh, question. It's one you and I talked about and actually came up in the chat box too. Um, here at the Retirement Center, we've been dealing a lot with uh, issues related to unexpected and early retirements. You know, it might be the 50-something teacher who's saying, I'm not willing to go back to in-person classes, so I'm going to retire. Or it might be a 60-year-old who says, I, I'll give up my job so the younger person can keep hers, or, you know, that kind of thing. But it occurs to me that health insurance is a major challenge. And, you know, what's an early retiree do? Obviously, you have COBRA. And uh, for those of you who aren't aware of it, the CARES Act uh, has helped in the area of COBRA. It extends COBRA election period 60 days to, again, whatever the outbreak period is. Um, and it extends um, premium payments and grace periods. So there's some room there, but, but it's tricky. Um, I, I suppose if you retire early, you could seek coverage through your spouse, though obviously a lot of employers' insurance plans say that the other spouse um, can't have access to insurance. That gets tricky with uh, COBRA. Uh, coverage through an exchange, you know, and depends what's available out there since ACA is in flux. Um, and one other that uh, some of the questions have come up is, uh, depending on your situation, maybe you have TRICARE or military um, benefits that you can get that way as well. But at the, the bottom line to all this is we have to remind ourselves is no spousal coverage is available through Medicare. So what I'm asking you, just with all your experience, is recognizing this is catching consumers off guard with these early retirements. Any thoughts on how advisors can, you know, help those, those poor clients navigate the health insurance challenge caused by an, an early retirement? Yes, I can. I, I think one of the things that we're having some issues that we're dealing with uh, CMS right now, I sit on the uh, key uh, FMO council for NAHU, and, and we're trying to address several of the issues around COBRA being credible coverage and things with, with Medicare. So there's some messiness there. But I think right now that you have to be really careful uh, with the enrollment periods and dates because that person could miss opportunities. Uh, they could enroll at the wrong time into Medicare Part B and be using up some of that period of time while they're still working. Uh, very often, you know, ill advice comes from even well-meaning sources. Uh, there's some local sources and even governmental organizations that sometimes will give incorrect information for enrollment times. And it can literally lock a person out of coverage for a period of time or incur lifelong penalties. My recommendation is, is to use the tools uh, to answer those individuals' questions. Um, there's one that's, that you can see on the slide there where it says eligibility and premium uh, calculator home on the left-hand side. Yeah, right where your mouse is. Um, that particular tool is a if this, then this walkthrough. And it will address uh, and ask some of the questions that will help a person decide 
when they should enroll, what their costs are going to be and things like that. There's also some very powerful tools uh, on medicare.gov. Uh, one point I might make about these sites is that medicare.gov is a, a consumer site, so it's made for Medicare beneficiaries. CMS.gov is made for providers, and so uh, providers and carriers. And so when you're looking at those pieces of information, there's tools and things that you can go grab off them, but consumer facing type tools on medicare.gov. There's um, like, for instance, a, the retiree insurance uh, site that you see there on the lower left. That's a, that's has a step by step and key questions for when a person retires. Uh, and again, I'll be happy to send or provide all the links for these. Um, or I have employer coverage and it goes through several of the questions like, okay, are you turning 65 and, and have employer coverage? Are you over 65 already? Or are you under 65 and maybe have disability? Uh, and then just a, there's a lot of general line of questions around Medicare. Social Security also puts out a nice publication. Um, it just says Medicare across the top of it. It's not too flashy, but it's really, it's full of good information. Um, that uh, form number is 10043, in case anybody's curious about that. But um, the uh, then longtermcare.gov, since a lot of you do work with long-term and long-term care issues, longtermcare.gov has a really good age 65 pathfinder with some good helpful reminders. And the reason I like that particular one is they're going to support what you're doing as an advisor. They're going to support the recommendations for the need for planning. They're not talking about the specifics of your advice or how they're going to, to utilize those, but it definitely speaks to the fact that Medicare is not an answer to long-term care issues. So my advice to that and answer to you is use the tools that are out there, avoid any hard statements uh, to individuals unless you have a considerable number of facts uh, and allow uh, some of the online answers to be your keys to addressing those questions. Makes sense. Um, and related to that, and just because of time, I'll, I'll just ask that we just kind of do it quickly, but any thoughts on Medicaid simply because, you know, is, is it going a similar way or is it going a different way? What are you seeing with that for those who uh, would qualify for Medicaid? Uh, Medicaid is going to in a similar way uh, in and I have been asked to work with several of the states in trying to address their plans but have to keep in mind that a lot of their the taxes that are, are their tax base has been reduced Medicaid expansion has happened considerably um, and putting a lot more people on their rolls uh, so it's going to be a real issue for uh, Medicaid next year going into next year uh, and so, you know, and one of the points that I don't think a lot of people realize about Medicaid is that there, some of the benefits are mandatory, like medical care and others are optional. Mm -hmm. Pharmacy is technically an optional benefit, even though every state offers it. So it, that includes some long-term services and support uh, that are happening right now through waiver authority. So I think to, if you're gonna watch a, a market, uh, Medicaid is it and watching how Medicare Advantage is being increasingly utilized to play the role of Medicare uh, with Medicaid wrapping around it and opening up some doors that, uh, for people on Medicare, Medicaid. That, that explains the TV commercials they've been seeing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, yes. Don't want to get into politics here, but as we get closer to the hour, uh, any thoughts about uh, general health insurance issues on the horizon for the elderly? I mean, uh, you've seen a lot of changes. What's, uh, what do you think's going on? Well, um, there's been a lot of relaxing of protections that were put in place to protect health. Um, like this month, um, thousands of oil and gas operations and other government facilities got permission to stop monitoring hazardous emissions. And, and uh, so who knows what the long-term effects are from that, so that's that's a very long-term effect. I think the big is the is the chronic conditions uh, that you're going to be seeing uh, 
just simply because of individuals who may not be symptomatic or have anything with COVID that may have may be complicated, may be complicated other issues. Many more outpatient activities, many, many more, uh, including there's something called an, an IPO list, which essentially allows uh, payment for certain types of care that have to be hospital uh, confined. They're talking about doing away with that list, eliminating the inpatient only IPO list and opening that up. Uh, so that means a lot of outpatient type things potentially. Um, but I think you're also going to see um, obvious expansion in the telemedicine and all home-based activities. Um, and then I have listed on that slide that the HIT tax uh, is, uh, has been repealed. And that was many, many billions of dollars that CARES had to pay this year. Uh, that's going to be way for next year, and that's going to open up a lot of things. And then uh, what I have there at the bottom, the Medicare Part D with lower cost insulin. So you're seeing a lot of nice reactions uh, from several different fronts that are going to actually benefit individuals if they if they utilize them properly. Yeah, makes sense. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you, when I went on Medicare, I was actually uh, pleasantly surprised by the resources available to help me uh, navigate it. I mean, not just CMS has great materials, but all these volunteers in this, the various states uh, helping you know, figuring out these challenges. Uh, can you let our advisors, and I want to talk a little bit at the end about RICP, but let our advisors know uh, what some of the resources are that are available out there so they don't feel alone. I'm getting questions about donut holes and and Irma and that kind of stuff. Uh, what kind of resources are out there? Yeah, you know, one of the things about uh, Medicare is like you said, there's a, a lot of information, but there's not a lot of knowledge about how to apply the information. And that's, that's the problem. And, and, you know, you do have some individuals who really do know how to do that, but uh, you have to be very, very cautious. For instance, a medication that may be covered by Medicare may not be covered by Medicare for their condition and just different issues like that. But there are several places that you can get information if you want to actually watch the activities of all of the carriers. CMS actually provides a place for you to be able to go and watch that and see that on a month by month basis, what carrier enrolled, how many in each county, etc. All of the landscapes are available there, which allow you to see all of the plans. There's a, a Medicare web resources to help employees. This is really, really good site to help uh, to give to employers. Uh, so you can give it to the HR director and it's a site on CMS that is a kind of a one-stop shop for all that. It may be very good for all of you as well to be able to have a, a, a snapshot where you can look at, you know, the issues and, and terminologies around Medicare Part D with like, like the donut hole, which is essentially whenever they go from having full coverage to only partially coverage on their, on their drugs to many, many other areas. So that's on, on, on CMS.gov. On Medicare.gov, I've kind of shown you some of those, but one of the key things I would look at on Medicare.gov is if you go there on the right-hand side, there's a resource tab and if you scroll down, there's publications. Those publications can be a fantastic resource for you to be able to answer and address specific issues around uh, several of the things that have been brought up uh, and several others. But I do like the fact that they are compliant and they're free. Those are two of my favorite things about them. But there's also really quick reference sites. You, uh, mentioned earlier with the retirement literacy how many how few people knew about the the preventive things there's one section that it t shows all the different tests or you can key in there to see if your test is covered or not by medicare so i would use those kind of tools again i'll make sure that i can i send any kind of links for you you the between the publications uh and some of the you know good point two sites for your clients you can cover just virtually every base. Uh, and if there's outlier issues, uh, there are definitely places that you can just type in in the searches for that. But 
again, I would not, I would be very, very careful where you look. Uh, use uh, sites like Social Security, uh, CMS, or Medicare, and make sure it actually says .gov at the end. If you do go out to Google some of these things, you're going to get a lot of misdirection. A lot of things that look official that truly are not. That's a good point. And, and I obviously want to just throw in our pitch for uh, training in general with the RICP. We definitely do uh, Medicare training and we've updated it. And that's a very important part of it. I had a good question here in the, the uh, Q&A. Um, and, and you've reminded us, be careful what you, you Google. Uh, do you know of any resources or websites that share like estimated costs of Medicare for beneficiaries over their lifetime? Because so many people that are listening are, are planners and they want to get that client moving on this. So can you think of anything that does a good job with that? Yeah, there's a couple that I, I can send links out. I, here's the thing that's been interesting for me from an advisor standpoint is the healthier a person is, the more their expected medical medical costs are after retirement. A lot of people think it's the other way around, but uh, the increased illness reduces life expectancy. And because of that, uh, it distorts uh, what those costs might be. Short term, they're gonna have obviously higher costs. Longer term, overall, the overall cost is higher. So yeah, I'll be sure to include that in some of the resources, some of the sites where they can key in the information, but Keep in mind, it's not just, you know, age uh, and sex and general health information that needs to be looked at. As all the advisors on this line know, there's a lot of factors you want to look at to make sure that you're getting a very real picture for that. Okay, that helps. Um, and uh, I will say, I, th I think we have a hit here because we're just being, we have a ton of questions, which is the kind of problems I like to have. Um, so, um, we, to remind people, because I have several people saying, I like this, how do I get at this? We will post, um, the, the link to this, this is our first time we went on zoom versus, uh, plan B. <laughs> so we will post that and that will include the slides. And again, uh, we're going to get some of these sites and make that available. Uh, we appreciate you doing that, Dan. And we're going to give you his website because he offered. <laughs> um, so because uh, there's so many great questions, but let me kind of at least hit on a few of them here uh, with the time we have remaining. Um, just some of the questions that I see that I thought were pretty good. They were all great. Don't get me wrong. Um, because we have planners here. And so, so many of us are thinking about tax issues. Like someone was asking about the fact I used an IRA to bring down my modified adjusted gross income and avoid a big kick up on the, the Medicare Part B. Um, and they were asking if you could use life insurance. And I guess my answer to that is not really because I, it was an IRA that got me my, um, got it down. But I, I've had a couple people here ask about the whole IRMA process and how you appeal it. I, I think, could you take just a moment to explain the, the basic idea there so that they might be able to make their clients aware of the issue? Absolutely. Uh, a comment that you made a minute ago was probably one of the most key areas, and that was you reduce your income by a few dollars and it changed. Mm -hmm. It's not a percentage. It's a dollar amount yep. of, of income. And so because of that, you can plan and avoid it by just a few dollar changes. It is also important to note that they use a two year old tax return. And because of that, individual situations have changed. I mean, a lot of times when a person retires, obviously their income can have pretty dramatic changes. Uh, maybe they had a windfall of some kind that changed that. But there, there is unquestionably a, a appeals process uh, that, again, I hate to keep referring to the links, but it's so much better for everyone on the line here to be able to see those links, see those documents and exactly how to appeal it. It's not a difficult appeals process, but you have to know right where to go, you know, on ssa.gov and stuff to get those, those documents. So I'll make sure that that is included in those links. But again, Medicare premiums are based on actual cost of Medicare Part B overall. 
and then those percentages start to change as that per person uh, has a higher income. And so as those percentages go up, so do health uh, uh, costs, or the premium for Part B and Part D, by the way, costs go up. That is always a concern. I'm not saying it's a, a huge concern, but it's always a concern as to um, what is the whole premium for Medicare? I mean, it's what's the whole cost for Medicare Part B? I mean, it's like looking at a group health insurance plan. You start having a lot of health conditions like we're seeing, what's the cost of the whole plan gonna look like? If you're having to pay 50% of all that, if it's a bigger number, you're paying 50% of a bigger number. So those numbers could be reflective, making the, uh, just making sure that that person is not in the wrong income category for what they're happy to pay. Right, right. And speaking of the cost, um, on supplemental, uh, and since Plan F is no longer available for new users, do you think the month monthly cost of this plan is going to go up because you have fewer and few, fewer people who are signing up for this plan? I thought that's a good question. You know, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful question. In fact, it's a question that I, I've been asked by many actuaries. Uh, the answer to that is in time. Right now, it's a plus. Actually, you're gonna see really strong plan F rates um, that it is, uh, is a response to the fact that they're not, no, plan F is no longer a GI. So they're missing all those really high risks and those are all having to go to, to plan G or plan D. And so um, they're missing a lot of the expenses right now. So until that block starts getting older, uh, then they're really not going to have those that feeling of that. After a few years, when they start to get some age on 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 that block, and they start seeing the losses because of age, yes, you'll see some premiums. But actually, you'll probably see some pretty strong plan F rates for the next couple of years. Okay, and and I guess it leads to another question that we have asked in different versions that I'm looking at is I think what we heard you saying is there is going to be a movement more towards medical uh, to Medicare Advantage versus supplementary plans. Is that is that a general conclusion of yours or any thoughts on that? Just so we're, that we're clear what you're thinking there. No, it's 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 a factual conclusion. It's a, I can show you the exact numbers of that. That has been consistently on the rise. Right now, they're pretty much neck to neck. Uh, for individuals that are electing it, about a third of the individuals go to Medicare Advantage, about a third of them go to Original Medicare, uh, and then the others are, of course, in, inside Original Medicare, but for the people through other programs like Medicaid, et cetera. But it, for people who are electing a plan, the numbers are starting to tilt towards Medicare Advantage, and it's because Medicare Advantage can add some bells and whistles that uh, Medicare supplements cannot. Medicare Advantage is federally regulated. Medicare supplements are state regulated. Uh, so there's all different rules around them. But uh, even, even when you look at clinical outcomes, uh, Medicare Advantage has some, some keys to that and they're getting a little bit better at that because they can respond to chronic conditions and things a little bit more than Medicare supplements. But then you have limitations of network, co-pays, co-insurance. So there's always a trade-off. You have network and and access to any provider versus and more fixed cost versus less fixed cost and more restrictive network but more benefits. Good I, I just didn't want to put words in your mouth but uh, it's good hearing that from you rather than just Joe Namath uh, when I watch TV. <laughs> uh, I hear that name a lot. Uh, many of you have seen those commercials. Um, okay, well, I want to emphasize to everybody one last time that uh, really had some really good questions here. And so I'm going to organize them and make sure I get some of those questions to Dan that are in his area of expertise. A few of you were asked about RICP and that kind of thing. And I'll, I'll get back to you um, if we can figure out how to do this all with the switch over to Zoom. I'm glad that Zoom works today since yesterday it wasn't working. Um, so, uh, Dan, I really want to thank you for this very meaty um, set of information. This was just uh, great that you were able to do that. But again, Dan, thank you very much. Uh, any last uh, wonderful words for the audience before uh, we, we call it a day? 
the only thing is, is that we all have to work hard to protect the the perce perception of a need for an advisor that unfortunately is under attack uh, and all of us are, are well served. My, my statement is thank you very much to everyone out there that has dedicated their lives to helping them, helping the population to stay healthy and wealthy. Good job and I wish everybody uh, good health and to stay well and we'll let you know when we're gonna have the next one. Thanks again, Dan.